Hello and welcome to the video diary number one. We've reached Rome where we're pausing before we go on south to the colonies of Magna Graecia to see one or two things uh, here and in particular we're going to go to the Vatican to see a sculpture which I'm going to want to share with you and I'm also going to share some Latin readings from Virgil's Aeneid by the wonderful Matthew Hargreaves and the brilliant Llewellyn Morgan. But before we do that, our story started a couple of days ago, some 60 miles up the coast from here, in a small town called Tarquinia. Now Tarquinia, in its heyday, very very long time ago, was a major powerful centre in the northern half of Italy, long before Rome was anything to speak of. You may be wondering why we're starting our tour of Magna Graecia here in the non-Greek Etruscan centre of Tarquinia. Well, the first reason is practical. We've just crossed the Alps and we needed somewhere to water the elephants. But in fact, the Etruscan culture was flourishing at the same time as the Greek colonies in the south. In other words, from the 8th to the 5th centuries BC. And they had a lot to do with each other. Much of it friendly, some of it not. The Etruscans were a major power long before Rome was on anyone's map, at a time when these Greek cities in the south were fully flourishing. The Etruscan burial sites, their necropolis, reveal an astonishing array of art, of wall paintings, of painted pottery and other artefacts. Now, their houses were made of perishable materials like wood and thatch, but not so their tombs. Their stone coffins, their sarcophagi, these have sculpted images of the people buried there. One or two are quite poignant and sad, as here, the sculpture of this young child. Here we see a connection with the Greek world, this 6th century meto showing the suicide of poor old Ajax, a Greek warrior who felt insulted when he was not given the armour of the dead Achilles. And what is so striking about some of these sculptures is the extraordinary, very realistic depiction of the characters who were buried here. It's as if they're continuing their lives by just lying here, chatting to each other, having a social, exchanging some gossip, having a drink or two. And when we see the realism and personality of these characters, it's not difficult to see where the Romans got their taste for portraiture from. The festive spirit is everywhere inside the tombs themselves, where wall paintings show a variety of scenes, many drinking and making merry, music, athletics, and one or two darker ones depicting people manhandled by demons on their way to the underworld. These tombs are, are laid out as a necropolis and replicate the town plan of where each person lived. And the people, of course, in these tombs were not just you and me, they were the wealthiest people of the community. These frescoes date from the 6th, 5th and 4th centuries BC and they represent the best collection of wall paintings from the period. They have a close affinity to the Greek style, particularly Ionic, and possibly even were painted by Greek craftsmen. Who knows? The richness of the finds from the Etruscan world confirms that Greek art, sculpture and pottery, and with those their myths, gods and heroes, were all over the Italian peninsula from as early as the 7th century BC, the 8th century BC, and that's the period when the earliest records we have of Greek stories were first written down. And I mean Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, about the tenth year of the war between the Greeks and the Trojans, and Odysseus's return home. These two poems do not tell us the story of the actual fall of Troy. For that, we have Virgil's Aeneid, a Latin poem by a Roman poet. And he includes the tale of Laocon, whose sculpture we're going to see today 
in the Vatican Museum. Now Larkon, you may know, was a priest of Troy who came charging out of the city to tell his fellow citizens and comrades, please, 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 please don't trust this wooden horse, which had been parked there, and the Greeks, of course, had departed, had vanished. Don't trust it, there's something wrong with it, he said. Don't know, there may be Greek warriors inside it. And there were. His words are read by Matthew Hargreaves. Oh, misery! Quae tanta insania cives, creditis au ectos hostis, autulla putatis dona carere dolis danaum, sit notus ulixes, aut hoc inclusi lignoc cultantor aciwi, aut aic in nostros fabricat est machina muros, inspectura domus, venturaque desuper urbi, aut aliquis latet error, Equo ne credit et teo cri. Quid quidid est, timeo danaos et dona ferentis. Well, a short while later, Larkon is not far away. He's busy making a sacrifice at an altar, and with him are his two young sons. When, from across the sea, come, breasting the surf, two enormous snakes which make a direct line for the three of them and they seize them and they start to crush the life out of them and they bite them and they poison them. This is read for us by Llewellyn Morgan. De fucimus viso ex sanguis il yang menecerto laocaonta petunt et primum parva duorum corpora natorum serpens amplexus uterque implicat, et miseros morsu de pascitur artus. The sculpture is as horrendous as it is magnificent. Now, in Virgil's story at least, the connection between his death and the warning he gave his fellow citizens is not really made that obvious or explicit. But his fellow citizens and comrades, they're in no doubt at all. They believe that that's a sign telling them that uh, they should take the wooden horse into the city. And they do. And that's the beginning of the end for Troy.